It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the AOC 24G2 SPU, or 24G2 SP, depending on your region. The OSD is controlled by buttons. They're located on the underside of the bottom bezel. You can see there are some button labels on the bottom bezel itself, but in most lights they're actually quite difficult to see. Unless it's quite bright in the room and you've got a little bit of light reflecting on them directly. The menu system in general can take a bit of getting used to. I mean, I've used this kind of system for many AOC monitors in the past. They've used this for many years, but if you're not used to it, so if you go into the main menu, you press the fourth button there to do that. Your first button is then back. Your second button, which has a left arrow, which you might just about be able to see is left. Right arrow is right. And then the fourth button there, which you press to get into the menu, that's enter. So you can see there are two arrows either side of colour setup, so you press the second button or third button to move left or right. If you want to go deeper into the menu system, you then press the fourth button, which is the one with the little menu icon, and then you again press the second and third button to navigate. So it's left or right, but really in this case it's up or down. And then if you want to go deeper into the menu again, so say I wanted to change the low blue mode, I would then press enter, and you'll see it highlights it green, so that's the fourth button, enter. And then you can again use the arrows. You want to go back, you press the first button, which is back. So hopefully you get the idea. It does take a little bit of getting used to. I'm quite used to it. But in general, I think people prefer a little joystick or a navigational control instead. Another quirk to be aware of is that the speed of the menu system, it's quite good if you're running the monitor at a high refresh rate, but it actually scales with the refresh rate. So if I quickly set this to 60 hertz, for example, that will slow the menu down then starts to feel relatively laggy. It isn't unique to this model, it's something which I've noticed on other AOC monitors with a similar menu system. So again, sorry about the Moiré, the little interference pattern, there's not really much I can do about that because my arm isn't long enough to reach the controls otherwise, and it has a fairly low pixel density, this monitor, so it's just something you'll have to cope with. It might disappear a little bit further into the video. If you press the first button when you're not in the main menu system, you can cycle the input used by the monitor. You just keep pressing the first button to cycle through the inputs. You then press your enter button, which is the fourth button, to select the input. Press the second button, which is the left arrow on its own. You can activate one of the game modes, and I'll go through them when I get to them in the main menu system. The third button along, the right arrow, that puts this little thing that they call a dial point crosshair in the middle of the screen, little crosshair. You can't change the design, you can't reposition the crosshair, it's just on or off with the little red design shown. But if you press the third button, that's how you get the crosshair up. You press the third button, when you're not in the main menu system, that gets rid of the crosshair. So into the main menu now, press the fourth button to get there. Contrast and brightness, your usual controls there. There's eco mode and that just sets the brightness to a preset value and then blocks off control of brightness and contrast. The exception here is reading. That makes everything grayscale, but you can adjust the brightness according to your taste with this setting. So standard is the default one that allows you to have full control of the brightness and contrast setting and doesn't make everything grayscale. Gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma settings are explored in the review. DCR, dynamic contrast ratio, also explored in the review. Just on or off for that. There's HDR mode. This is a bit of a strange one, and I don't like how they've named this. It's very misleading. This has absolutely nothing to do with HDR, high dynamic range. This monitor does not support an HDR signal. It doesn't respond to an HDR signal. But all these do is they just oversaturate the image. It pulls shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you lose shade variety, but it gives things more saturation, more pop, and crushes things together if you like that kind of look. It also applies a sharpness filter. So it sharpens the image up, or over sharpens the image, I should say. But if you subjectively like this, then fine, feel free to use them. But be under no illusion, it does upset the image on a technical level. The HDR picture setting is the weakest effect. HDR movies is a bit stronger, and HDR game is the strongest effect here. Image setup next, but that's greyed out unless you're using VJ, the analog connection. That is something which is all optimized for you automatically if you're using a digital connection. I kind of wish AOC didn't include this because it does confuse people. They wonder why it's greyed out and they want to access the settings there. But as I said, it only applies to analog connections. So if you're a little bit confused about that, that's the reason. So next is color setup. You can change the color temp. This is the preset value. It's set to warm by default. 
normal, which is actually quite cool. It has a rather high white point. Cool, which has an even cooler white point, an even higher white point. It looks very bluish, icy look to the image. sRGB, this is an sRGB emulation setting. Not a particularly good one because it not only locks your color channels, which isn't really the main thing, although my unit was too cool tinted by default, but it also locks off your brightness control, very importantly, and your gamma, but really the brightness control is the main thing. It locks it to 90, very bright on this model, too bright for most people, so most people won't want to use this setting. There are alternative sRGB emulation methods you can use, they're explored in the review. And next you've got user that allows you to access the red, green and blue colour channels. So you can make changes here and they'll be remembered when you've got colour temp set to user. There's then a DCB mode, dynamic colour boost and DCB demo. These are kind of like that HDR filter I was telling you about before but they have a bit of a different effect but they oversaturate the image. So there's full enhance which oversaturates all shades nature skin which focuses mainly on your red tones, green field which oversaturates the green selectively, sky blue which focuses on your blue shades to oversaturate, and auto detect which generally just leaves it at full enhance but it's supposed to look at the image and make some changes based on that. If you like to use this then fine but again it's upsetting the image and you lose shade variety and that kind of thing. DCB demo, this gives you a split screen with the setting on versus off. I'm not sure exactly how it sets it up with it on. It looks a little bit different to any of the other settings, even full enhance on half of the screen right now. You probably can't see this in the video, but there's a split down the middle. Anyway, if you happen to notice that exactly half of your screen looks different, it's probably because you've got DCB demo on. Next, you've got picture boost. This allows you to control the bright frame setting. What this does is it puts a frame on the screen. You can control the size of that frame. You can see it in the top left at the moment. And this allows you to independently control the brightness and contrast of that particular section of the screen. You can have it filling the whole screen if you want to tweak things in that way. But be aware that this is digital brightness. It doesn't adjust the backlight brightness. So you're gonna be losing contrast if you reduce this below 50. But it's really for people who just like to tweak the image endlessly. It will change the gamma, for example, give you finer control over the gamma, that kind of thing. So if you wish to do that, by all means do. The idea if you're just using it for part of the screen would be to highlight a section of the screen, make it look different, make it stand out. There's OSD setup. This allows you to change the language that the OSD is displayed in. There's the timeout period, which I should have really extended before starting this video. So it's set to 10 seconds at the moment. You can set it to five seconds if you're a complete ninja with the OSD system, or 120, 120 seconds. And this is the time before the OSD will automatically collapse in on itself. Or of course, you can press the first button there, exit a few times to get rid of it manually. Next is DP capability, display port capability, 1.2 or 1.1, 1.2 for the full capabilities of the monitor, 1.1 is just there for compatibility for older systems. You can change the horizontal and vertical position of the OSD on the screen. You can change the volume. This will change the volume of something connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack if you're using that. Or if you've got the U variant, then there are integrated speakers and that can change the volume of those. I know this is quite well hidden and I do get people asking about this one. So do take note that this is in the OSD setup section of the menu because it's not always obvious how you adjust the volume on this model. Transparency changes the transparency effect. You can increase or decrease that. Break reminder, that will give you a little message on the screen after an hour just to remind you to take a break. Then you press a button and it gets rid of the message. USB. That's set to off by default. The reason for that is that it will slightly decrease the standby power consumption. Even if you're not using the USB ports, they will use a little bit of power. So if you're not using them, that's why it should really be set to off, ideally. If you're trying to use the USB ports and they're not working, it's probably because this USB setting is set to off. And again, that's in the OSD setup section of the menu. You've then got game setting. So there are game modes. These are the presets of the monitor. There is FPS, RTS, Racing, Gamer 1, Gamer 2, Gamer 3, and Off, which is my preferred one. So FPS, for example, and really any of the sort of named genres of game, they make various changes to the image. For example, it massively oversaturates the image. Again, it's crushing your shade variety, doesn't look nice. Really, things don't look as they should, but if you subjectively like the look, then fine. But be aware that brightness is locked at 100, so it's very bright. And you can't change the gamma or anything like that either. I've just quickly opened Legom, by the way, legom.nl, the black levels tests there. And 
I can't see particularly good visibility. This isn't a dark room, but even so, usually FPS settings would lower the gamma to give you enhanced visibility in dark areas. This one doesn't do that, so be aware that it's not going to give you an edge there. RTS does do that a bit. Might not be clear in the video, but it's actually lightened these things up quite a bit. There's racing, and these are all crushed. You can probably see that it's in the video that the gamma is actually very high now. Things look very cinematic, very oversaturated. I'm not really sure why this would be appealing for racing games, to be honest. Gamer 1, Gamer 2, Gamer 3, they're a little bit more flexible because you can actually adjust the brightness, which is nice. You can play around with anything other than the colour setup menu, and they might work for you, that's fine, but with my unit, the colour temperature was really quite off base with these settings, and I had to make manual adjustments, which I would need to have this set to off to do. Also be aware of the overdrive control, you might have noticed that was unavailable on these. It's set to weak, set to off, medium. You can change it with Gamer 1, Gamer 2, and Gamer 3, but with the named settings, that was actually greyed out as well. And to have overdrive set to weak for FPS makes absolutely no sense, for example, so very odd choice there. So again, my recommendation is just to leave game mode off and just make manual tweaks if you wish. There's also a setting called Shadow Control, set to 50 by default, so that's the correct neutral point if you like. If you increase that, even one, it completely floods the image. You can probably see that quite clearly. Even the black depth is raised significantly, so you massively lose contrast with this setting active. But it does make things more visible, and you can increase this further for a greater effect. So it's quite ridiculous set to 100, to be honest. It has probably a contrast ratio. I haven't actually measured it, but I'd guess it's under 100 to 1 at this point. It's quite ridiculous. So I would have preferred more of a granular approach without it affecting the black, but this is what it does. It's not the best implementation of this kind of feature. It will give you a bit of a competitive edge, at least if you set it up a little bit. So just to 60, for example, it does lighten up some of those darker shades. And if you decrease that further, even just one level to 40, then it really crushes things together massively. I don't know why you'd want to have it any further than that. Things are practically invisible now. No distinctions at all when that's set to zero. So not the best implementation of that kind of feature. For the overdrive control, that's a pixel response time setting the greater gray acceleration off, weak, medium, or strong. I generally recommend medium, but I do discuss this more in the review. Game color, this will oversaturate the image if you increase that. Again, you're losing shade variety. It's pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. If you decrease that, then you start losing saturation. Even if you set this to nine, some shades become noticeably undersaturated and look quite foggy, actually. So it's very difficult to fine tune things in this respect. But if you do subjectively prefer how this looks increased a little bit or perhaps decreased a little bit, then by all means do it. That's what it's for. And also I should mention that some people see having this crushed together, oversaturated look can give a bit of a competitive advantage for some games. It kind of gives you less to process in a way. It can make backgrounds in games perhaps less distracting, more uniform, that kind of thing. That could be the argument some people make. So have a play with this if you wish. Low blue mode. This is a low blue light setting and I explore this in the review. Multimedia, internet, office, reading. So they're getting stronger and stronger. Reading is the strongest low blue light setting. It works pretty effectively. MBR, motion blur reduction, that's greyed out unless you have adaptive sync disabled. I'm not gonna show you this on the video because all you're gonna see is flickering of the screen. It's a strobe backlight setting. It's all explored in the written review. You can set this MBR setting though between one and 20 in single unit increments. 20 is the least bright but potentially gives you the best motion clarity. This really becomes your brightness control with MBR active. In other words, you can't adjust the brightness by other means, so the main brightness setting's locked off if you're using MBR. Also be aware there is an overdrive setting called Boost, which is available if you don't have adaptive sync enabled, and all that does is it sets MBR to 20 and sets overdrive to strong. Adaptive sync, this is a setting you enable for VRR, variable refresh rate support on the monitor, so that's AMD FreeSync, or it is NVIDIA G-Sync compatible mode, or if you've got an Intel system can use adaptive sync, then that's relevant to that as well. Frame counter, this gives you a little display of your current refresh rate. You can have it set to right up, right down, left down, or left up. I'm just gonna put it right down for now so you can see it on the screen easily. So you can see a little red number, 165. It means 165 hertz, but I've got VRR active. So if I just quickly open NVIDIA's Pendulum demo, you'll see this changing 
as the frame rate of the content changes. If you're not using Adaptive Sync, so you don't have VRR active, then this will simply display the static refresh rate that you've got selected, and it will not change to reflect the frame rate. Next, there's extra input select. You can have it automatically select the input for you, or you can manually select the input if you prefer. Auto config, that's just related to VGA again. It's the analog connection it's grayed out for digital connections, which is DisplayPort or HDMI. Off timer, this will automatically put the monitor onto standby after a given number of hours of use. Image ratio, that's grayed out unless you are using certain resolutions. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it is. I think it could be five by four aspect ratios and certain refresh rates as well. So it's a very particular setting and it's only available for certain non-native resolutions. So if you see this grayed out, that, that could just be that you're not running a resolution and refresh rate combination which supports this. I do believe it's either five by four or four by three. Personally, Full HD is the lowest resolution I use on monitors, so I don't actually test resolutions below that myself. DDC slash CI, that was a bit more difficult to say than usual for some reason. That is part of the plug and play functionality of the monitor that allows you to use software to control it, such as AOC G menu, which I'll show you very shortly. There is reset, which will reset everything to the factory default. And finally, there's just a little bit of information there showing you the resolution horizontal frequency and vertical frequency, or if you've got adaptive sync active, it just says adaptive sync there. So just a little bit of information there. And you can also exit the menu by selecting exit here. And just before I move on to G menu, final thing to note, little power LED there, that glows white when the monitor's on and glows orange when it enters a low power state, so signal to the system is lost. And there is a dedicated power button as well, in case you're wondering, because I didn't actually mention that before. Now, G menu, this is going to be very quick because G menu hasn't been released in a form which allows full adjustments on this model. So you can get it, you can get this from the link which is supplied in the description of the video. There's also a website portrait.com which has another version of G menu, but this monitor isn't supported at the moment on that one at all, so it won't work at all. But when you open this version of G menu, you can see the monitors lit up there. There are other peripherals if you happen to have other AOC peripherals as well, but I'm interested in controlling the monitor here. And it does allow you to change the low blue mode and it does that pretty quickly. And that is working. I'm not sure if you can see from the video, but I can see a definite change in color temperature. So this is working correctly. Setting has changed, do you want to apply? Well, it seemed to apply it anyway, so I'm not really sure why it's asking for a confirmation of that, but okay, whatever. Then there's eco mode, so you can change the preset to use by the monitor, but that's really all you can do. There are no further adjustments. If you click extended brightness profile, for example, it just has some power related settings. For example, you can have the monitor automatically shut down at a certain time and certain day, or a certain time on certain days. Activation timer, so just a few little power management settings here really if you want to use them but you can't change even the brightness of the display or anything like that there, there are no options to change anything other than selecting a preset really or the low blue settings really annoying the way it does this so here you can change the resolution orientation so these are just things you could change in windows as well there's nothing specific to the monitor here hdr setting i have no idea what that means this monitor doesn't have HDR and this doesn't seem to have any options on it. So again, really odd. Sync message, again, no explanation of what that does, no idea what that does. There's no USB charging option on this model. You can edit hotkeys. So most of this is grayed out because you can't change the shadow control, brightness or game mode on this model. But you can assign hotkeys to change the volume if you wish. So you could have, for example, Control Alt and Left and Control Alt and Right to decrease and increase the volume respectively, if you wish. You also have to select Hotkey On if you actually want to use these. I think it's probably that when I'm testing this monitor, it is quite new. I suspect that newer versions of G Menu will have more settings you can adjust on this model. But anyway, that's all I can test. And that's all there was to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the AOC 24 G2 SPU. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.